thanks everyone for being here. And of course, we're really grateful uh, to Human Energy and to UC Berkeley and St. Mary's and the Boundaries of Humanity and the conference organizers and everyone that's that's put this together. And I'm just also really excited to be here, you know, as, as a Bergeron Institute uh, fellow and with one of the directors. Uh, at the Institute with John Blake. Um, so I'll, I'll give a longer presentation and then John is gonna kind of give a shorter presentation that will respond and develop ideas uh, in a different direction. Um, but you know, it's really a tribute to the power of ideas that we can celebrate, you know, a hundred year anniversary, not of a person or of a text, but actually in this case, an idea like the noosphere. And when we think about it, of course, the noosphere is to some extent an idea of ideas. So it's the attempt to kind of expand and create a capacious enough category that can gather all of the ideas, thoughts, affects on this planet into a, uh, you know, essentially kind of a planet scale uh, idea of ideas. Um, and, you know, one of the things that comes out very quickly when you start talking about the noosphere hearing, hearing lectures on it is the degree to which there's a, kind of deep poetic uh, dimensions to it and aesthetic dimensions uh, that the noosphere kind of brings us into certain kinds of experience when we think about the term. And that's something that I'll dwell on in the beginning of the talk by going into the etymology and some of the ancient associations of noos and of sphere. Uh, as well that that those poetic associations or that motivational capacity makes the noosphere also a concept that can be complementary to more you know politically framed um, ventures uh, like cosmopolitanism so you know the, a, a, a movement and a uh, form of political theory that's familiar to many of us but one that puts less kind of emphasis on experience uh, and less emphasis on aesthetics than the noosphere so there's a complementarity possible there so I'll dwell a little bit on that in the talk and situate Teilhard and Vernatsky uh, in, that, in that approach to the noosphere. Uh, but then I'll kind of shift gears and talk about how some of the poetic associations of the noosphere make it a challenging concept for our current moment and our current context uh, and introduce alternative sphere terms that for some, depending on which presentations people were at this morning, we've already, mm -hmm. and including Terry's presentation at, at the opening, we've already encountered the infosphere and I'll be talking about the technosphere. Uh, and, you know, finally, towards the end of the talk, I'll suggest what is, what is uh, what's left for us if the noosphere doesn't necessarily match aspects of contemporary planetary dynamics um, in the way that Teilhard and Vernatsky may have proposed and when we have other sphere terms available as well. So that, that'll be the, the overarching structure. And I'll jump right in with the ancient associations. As, as Terry mentioned, I have a little bit of a classicist side. So I thought, you know, this is a good chance to, to use it. Um, and so I'll take us back all the way to Homeric poetry and archaic Greek, where we first have the word noos or, or nous. Uh, for those of you, many of you already know that nous is just a contracted form for noos. So it's the, the same word with uh, slightly different dialects of ancient Greek. Um, but I put up a few a few of the uh, translations. Almost always we hear mind, but going back to, uh, to antiquity and the ancient sources, uh, it's valuable to recognize that in Homer, the seat of noos was in the chest. So already immediately, it's a slightly more embodied idea than what we might associate with mind. Uh, so, and this is just generally true of Homeric psychology that mental and psychological terms were, were far more closely entangled with perceptual, affectual, emotional uh, capabilities. Uh, and so you have, you have, you know, noos as something that is combining cognition and perception and emotion and has elements of volition. So something like mind and heart together. And then there's a dimension of noos that's also, and this gets to kind of Terry's talk, actually, and how Terry was describing uh, symbolic thought as always the desire to see what's behind the symbol by the very nature of how symbols work, that noos was a way of perceiving where you perceived kind of the true reality. To give one example um, from Homer in the Iliad, the goddess Aphrodite comes to Helen and tells Helen to go to Paris, but she appears, Aphrodite appears in disguise. And Helen uses her noos to recognize that it's a god, you know, not, not the mortal disguise that Aphrodite has taken. So already I'm just trying to give us a sense of what the wider associations of the term are. You've got, you know, blends of conceptual, cognitive and perceptual. Uh, you have an idea of kind of sight and knowledge, but sight and knowledge that perceives to reality. Uh, and 
to add to this, you also have a distinction between the noos of human beings and the noos of the gods. So it, both gods and humans share noos, uh, but you know, as as one might expect, the noos of the gods is more powerful and more more far 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 sighted than the noos of humans. So you know, one of the terms here is uh, to to think about is the the mind of Zeus, the dios noos. Uh, is that which is kind of shaping the story of the Iliad, pulling the entire story along, um, and sometimes overriding the decisions that human human beings, uh, human Homeric characters uh, may be taking. So, um, you know, we already have this kind of hints of teleology coming in here with the mind of Zeus. Uh, you have a term that is, you know, a more capacious form of cognition than we often uh, will associate with mind. And one thing to point out that's a grammatical curiosity that has actually kind of an important uh, thematic uh, weight is that almost always in classical Greek and pre-classical Greek, noos is singular. So even though everybody has noos and participates in mind, it's also a singular idea. There's actually the plural form that is very rare until later Greek. So that already kind of sets up a unitive kind of quality for noos. And I, I'm hoping as I kind of unfold this, we start seeing resonances with what we've been hearing, you know, in Professor Delio's excellent talk and what, how, how others have been thinking about the noosphere today. So from that Homeric past, just moving a little bit forward in time, in Anaxagoras and the pre-Socratics, noos becomes a force that orders the whole cosmos. So it's the very thing that makes the cosmos a cosmos. Um, and you know the the word, the word in Greek the diokosmo diokosmon as the noos, and that then in Aristotle moves even further, and we have um, we have noos as the identity of the prime mover. So the Aristotelian vision of the divine as that towards which all things move, that which uh, organizes the universe, uh, is noos, and as well it's equated in Aristotle with to agathon, with the good. So the picture I want to paint here is the degree to which the associations of noos are kind of holistic, pull in the motivational as well as the cognitive, uh, have a kind of connection between the human and divine, and, uh, and as well already have strong elements of teleo teleology built into them. And the other thing to point out here is that noos has actually very few derivative terms in Romance languages and in English. You know, pretty much noosphere. You know, you've got you know the journal to put a plug for the Bergruen Institute. The journal's name is Noema, which is a derivative of noos. Um, and but because there's so few derivatives, it means that when we use the term, we're actually pulled back into this ancient history more directly. Like these, th this poetic, what we can argue is this kind of poetic matrix that forms the term is, is present uh, with kind of very little, uh, uh, very little intervening history, so to speak. Uh, so that's on the Noah side. So you can already see it, you know, very positive, very teleological all the way back to the Greeks. On the sphere side, it's also, you know, more than just the geometrical shape. Uh, you know, the, the word sphidos or, or sphida, uh, those two forms for the word sphere was the shape of really perfect inclusion and completion uh, for many of the ancient Greeks. And specifically Empedocles, and this will link back to Professor Delio's talk just now. Uh, in Empedocles, you had kind of in his cosmology, as many people here know, there were two universal forces that alternated strife and, and love. And as strife was, be, was ascendant in the universe, things would dissipate and disperse. And then when the force of love would, uh, would gain steam and, and become ascendant, everything would start to cohere. And at its peak, at the peak of love shaping the universe, everything would you know, kind of condense into a perfect sphere. And that sphere was itself alive, was itself divine and had a beauty to it. You know, one of the commentators on Empedocles describes it as the most beautiful shape of the cosmos, the Kaliston Eidos to Cosmo. And that sphere was also something that was exulting in its own kind of joyous coherence and wholeness. So no sphere is kind of an overloaded term. If you look at these two sides of the term, both of them have a kind of a deep association with holism, with uh, coherence, with teleology, with things kind of gathering together. So, you know, once we have kind of this in mind, we can really see where and why Teilhard de Chardin and Vernadsky, in a very kind of hopeful view of cosmic processes and specifically planetary dynamics, what they drew on when they put forward this term noos and noosphere. Um, and, you know, of course, Teilhard de Chardin 
and Vladimir Vernadsky are uh, described as two cosmic prophets of globalization. So before the term globalization was there, they were predicting you know, some of the trends, but they were also putting forward, especially through a term like the noosphere, a certain kind of a structure of experience that they were projecting that the whole world was moving into. And that structure of experience is then kind of informed by all of the associations they were bringing in from, from the noosphere. So hints of teleology, uh, identity with the good, a blend of perceptual and cognitive. Um, and, you know, so even when we see occasional passages in, for example, Teilhard about how things can go wrong with the noosphere developing. I, I would almost argue from a philological point of view, the term is not well suited for things going wrong. The term is very much a term of, of kind of holism and goodness um, and unity and diversity. And that tracks with, you know, despite the occasional passages in Teilhard, as many of you have read the work. So yeah, you wanted to hi. Oh, um, yeah, the text. Good, the text. Yeah, good point. I can, you know, it's a small screen and I probably put too much text on this slide. Is it this particular slide or in general? Yeah. In general? You can send it out. I'll, I'll I'll send it out. I can try to read, and I'll try to try to read and yeah, read. And, and share. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll read out some of the quotes on. So I, I had I had mentioned that they are the two cosmic prophets of globalization, um, and how that you know drawing on the nose for they're putting forward these positive teleological or at least teleological oriented uh, visions of how human beings are interrelating. And then I had two quotes: one from Teilhard and one from Bernatsky. Uh, just as highlights of the, the teleological uh, you know, dimension here. With Teilhard, he's saying, surely it is within this generalized cosmic process that the noosphere, a particular and extreme case, has its natural place and takes its shape. The maximum of consciousness emerging from the system of individual brains coordinated and mutually supporting. So the unit of quality, the fact that this is part of this cosmic process that's moving in a direction. And with Vernadsky, actually the teleology might be even stronger where he's saying, we have elementally chosen the right path leading into the noosphere. I say elementally, as the whole history of humankind is proceeding in this direction. Uh, the noosphere is the last of many stages in the evolution of the biosphere in geological history. The important fact is that our democratic ideals are in tune with the elemental geological processes, with the laws of nature and with the noosphere. So you can see slightly different visions of what the noosphere is between the two, but in both cases, a strong sense of teleology and a strong sense that ultimately this is moving towards the good. That's that's what I want to you know emphasize as as a kind of a core feature of both Teilhard and Vernadsky. One thing to point out that you can also see between these quotes is that um, for Teilhard, as we've seen uh, already in many presentations, the development of the noosphere is an envelope over the biosphere. It's distinct. For Vernadsky, it's the biosphere turning into the noosphere. So we can talk about the resonance. It's just an important and interesting difference to point out that the protagonist for Vernadsky is the biosphere and what's happening to it. The protagonist for Teilhard is a cosmic process that's kind of unfolding in layers. With all of those differences, however, the similarity is this positive, positive sense of the noosphere. But then what's the situation today? Um, you know, is in what sense were Teilhard and Vernadsky right and wrong? In what sense does the structure of experience for a globalized world that they projected m track and map onto the world that we've stepped into? And what I want to point out is that there are key predictions in Vernadsky and Teilhard where they each got things kind of quote unquote very correct, very right. But in being right, it actually works against the uh, the kind of world that the noosphere was was promising, and that that that's a, a tension that that is a kind of is worthwhile to to stay with. So we've already pointed out that they both predicted kind of generally globalization and human planetary interconnectivity accelerating, but then they made two kind of different predictions about the formation of the noosphere. For Vernadsky, uh, he predicted that the entire biosphere would transform into the noosphere through the influence of human thought, human technology, human science, uh, human interconnectivity. So the biosphere is going to radically kind of change. And of course, you know, hearing hearing talks like when I was in the morning about uh, the degree of the techno, what, what has happened with the technosphere, and I'll, I'll talk about this uh, more in a minute as well. 
you know, we really do have a radically transformed biosphere. Uh, for Teilhard, as uh, Professor Delio just mentioned in her talk, uh, Teilhard emphasized both the exciting kind of new role of computing and computers, and he emphasized the promise of communication technologies. So in that sense, as Clément Udall, who's here in the audience, has pointed out, he didn't quite predict the internet, but he predicted the two components of the internet, which is already, you know, fantastically impressive and interesting. And so, you know, so for Teilhard, you have, you have that kind of key prediction really kind of coming uh, coming to fruition in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and for Vernatsky, you have the idea of the biosphere being so radically transformed. But it's almost a be careful what you wish for kind of correctness. Not, not completely, because there are plenty of positive dimensions of the biosphere being transformed through, the, through human technology. And there are plenty of positive dimensions in computing and communication technology intersecting. But there are also plenty of new challenges. Um, and in that sense, you know, I listed, of course, you know, we're, many of us are familiar with the term the Anthropocene, uh, maybe capturing more of the Vernatskian prediction being kind of right, but leading to a very complex world and the sixth mass extinction and the suffering of, you know, biodiversity in the wake of the, of the transformation of the biosphere. Um, all of these runaway processes and new forms of alienation and, you know, the infosphere, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, that Terry was already pointing out, and that's come up in, in, in different talks as also posing vast challenges of their own. Uh, so to kind of take those kind of one by one, we have a situation where we don't quite have a straightforward noosphere in the way that that ancient term, uh, you know, uh, promised and in the way that Teilhard and Vernatsky, but we have the two, two of their key predictions give now kind of unfolding and forcing a recognition of different planetary spheres emerging that they didn't necessarily, you know, expect, at least not with the ambivalence that these planetary spheres have, uh, have presented themselves. So the first is the technosphere and the second is the infosphere. And I'll, I'll take them, uh, you know, one by one for the technosphere, you know, of course, as, uh, as different theorists have started to describe it, it kind of is a term to capture the sum total of our artifacts, our built environments, and the systems and the energy that's needed uh, to maintain uh, to maintain all of that kind of what you might even think of as weight. The, infosphere, the technosphere very much puts an emphasis on on mass and weight, and I even tried to visually kind of depict the technosphere as kind of weight over or within the biosphere. Um, and, not, and not to mention, of course, the waste that the technosphere uh, produces. Uh, and, you know, there's a paper in Nature that was already already uh, was cited earlier today. Uh, El Hacham's paper, uh, Environmental Modeling Experts, who have calculated that the technosphere now very likely is equal to or about to outweigh the entire biosphere. So, you know, anthropogenic mass output now outweighs all uh, biomass uh, or will soon. Um, and, you know, so you have already kind of, it's not no longer this kind of clearly positive sense that Vernatsky expected of the biosphere being transformed by the technosphere into the noosphere or being transformed by technology into the noosphere. Instead, you have a biosphere kind of fragmented and degraded often uh, by uh, proliferating technologies um, that also have, you know, plenty of ways in which they enrich human life uh, at the same time. So an ambivalent situation. Uh, the technosphere on top of it, unlike all of the other planetary spheres, unlike the biosphere, unlike the lithosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, it doesn't have a cyclical structure in the sense that it produces waste and pollution. Whereas the biosphere pre-human uh, presence cycles itself. Kind of, There's no real kind of quote unquote waste and pollution. It's, it's, a, it's a mostly kind of closed system. Uh, and so the technosphere in that sense has a kind of a runaway sphere quality to it uh, that already is, you know, is different from the kind of idea of wholeness and teleology that, that we, we see in the noosphere. Um, and that leads to this impression that uh, environmental, uh, environmental theorist and geologist Peter Half uh, has kind of put forward and written the most about the technosphere, that in a certain sense, it dominates human beings. That we, he, he, he points out that there's one experience of our technosphere in which we are not creating it, but rather it's our, our decision making is subordinate to the continued functioning of the technosphere because we depend so heavily, uh, so heavily on the technosphere. The, going back to the first use of technosphere in print by the science journalist Will Lepkowski, 
you, you already see this kind of appearing where he lamented or warned that uh, modern hum humankind and the modern human being is becoming a goalless, lonely prisoner of the technosphere. Um, so, you know, you can see it's a very different register and very different, um, very different kind of normative experiential structure than what the noosphere had, had promised. Uh, there's also the feeling that it's kind of quasi-autonomous that I mentioned, that it kind of dominates human beings, has logic of its own, and we can't completely control it. And so there's a feeling that we're kind of alienated from it, even though we're co-creating it. So whether we kind of agree with this analysis or not, what's interesting is that the term, there's enough pressure that this term has emerged that's so different from the noosphere. And this term, I would argue from the literature, there's quite a bit of attention now being paid to the technosphere, especially among kind of scientists uh, and theorists. And so, you know, so that's that's for Vernadsky's kind of be careful what you wish for kind of prediction where he's he's right. But at the same time, the world we've entered because he was right is not quite the world uh, that he may have envisioned. For Teilhard, uh, you know, we have the infosphere, which we've already heard about multiple times today as well, starting with Terry's talk. And, uh, you know, the whole kind of ecosystem of information and that's becoming increasingly globalized and complexified. This also goes back to like if the technosphere is early 60s, the infosphere is kind of late 60s uh, with Kenneth Boulding, uh, the environmental economist, but then also the futurist Alvin Toffler and now the philosopher Luciano Floridi. Uh, and it's a more neutral term. Technosphere already had a little bit of a kind of a concern from the start, as you guys saw with Lipkowski. With infosphere at its origins, it's a more neutral term where it's just simply a you know the sphere of planetary information and all of its original theorists were also did also point out that it's a kind of overlooked sphere like we recognize the technosphere but the infosphere because it's built on information is one that social scientists and theorists often overlook but then more recently and especially you know in the wake of all of the informational pathologies that we you know, that so many of us are concerned about, whether it's disinformation, whether it's, you know, the media landscape being kind of fragmented into bubbles, uh, whether it's the kind of informational complexity of even navigating kind of social life as a teenager now, uh, the infosphere and information is a deeply kind of now ambivalent uh, idea. And this is expressed perhaps best uh, by the media theorist Alexander Wilson, who was, was one of the only infosphere theorists or technosphere theorists who puts it into puts the term into direct conversation with the noosphere and he says like what we were promised the noosphere so to speak which for him uh the noosphere speaks to kind of a form of organic thought but instead we got a form of algorithmic and again he kind of starts using language of domination like he uses hobbes's leviathan that now the noosphere is being supplanted and dominated by an algorithmic le leviathan that the infosphere is so you know so uh, this in this sense again we see a similar structure as vernatsky's key prediction where Teilhard's key prediction is right but very much not the world that it was supposed to lead to uh, rather a deeply ambivalent world. And, you know, most recently we are confronting this with uh, the escalation of AI and the, you know, or advance in AI technologies. Um, and, you know, of course, AI, we can actually envision very directly as emerging out of really a planetary infospheric, uh, you know, mode or substrate in the sense that it's reservoirs of knowledge gathered from all around the world. And with, with uh, and I mean specifically generative AI, large language models um, and image generation. Uh, and there's a kind of a question of the degree to which is the AI aligned with human thought and human values? What do we have to do in order for it to be aligned with human thought? Is it, is it pose the risk of extinction or is it pose the you know, promise of, does it present us with the promise of a kind of a technological salvation? But if nothing else, there's definitely something disconcerting that people are worried about. And, and uh, you know, you could say it's, it, it might be the kind of flashpoint right now of how complex the relationship to Teilhard's prediction uh, is at the current moment uh, with, uh, with artificial intelligence. Um, so, okay, so we have technosphere, infosphere. You know, we have now a, uh, well, maybe I'll save that slide for a second. We have now a situation in which, you know, we see how right Teilhard and Vernadsky were. We also are, you know, in a world where we're, we're kind of grappling with that complexity and these terms speak to that complexity in a way the noosphere tends not to. So the question 
that this leaves us is what is then the value of the noosphere concept today so, and for the future, something that's important to think about at a centennial, of course. And, you know, one, one answer would be, you know, now that we have concepts like the technosphere and infosphere, if they speak more to our reality, then the noosphere becomes an important historical predecessor. And, you know, it's important to honor it, but we can kind of move on. That's one, one answer that it doesn't quite match the world that we're encountering. Maybe it will one day and we can retrieve it. That's one answer. Um, and I think in a certain sense, I almost want to say it's true in that I don't think the noosphere can serve as a more as the kind of straightforward positive teleology concept that at least you know dominant readings of Teilhard and Vernadsky would suggest that it was. I think it's harder to have that broadly active um, in in 2023. But there's another way of thinking about the noosphere. So to kind of rescue the concept that I'm working so hard to an extent to uh, undermine, but you know I, I do both. <laughs> um, uh, I, I kept, you know, in, in my sleeve until now, artificially, a whole different tradition of sphere thought that I didn't talk about at the beginning that many people here may know. And this is the kind of celestial idea, as, as ancient as Empedocles' spheres, um, of the music of the spheres. And this, is a, this was a tradition that really underscored the pl plurality of spheres and saw, you know, in the geocentric universe or the Earth at the center, and then spheres carrying the planets around the earth and carrying the sun and moon around the earth. And those spheres, uh, back to Pythagoras, to Aristotle, and through the Middle Ages, those spheres as they moved were thought to produce sound, uh, you know, sound that the higher kind of form of hu the human ear could, uh, could hear. So it's actually shifting from a sight, one thing to point out, we're shifting from a, uh, an idea of sight to an idea of sound. And uh, you know, and so as they moved around each other and produced this sound, the ancients saw this sound as producing harmonies and producing music. Uh, and, you know, C.S. Lewis, I'll read this, this quote. He has a great book called The Discarded Image on some of the aspects of the geocentric universe that we've forgotten, including the harmony of the spheres. And he points out that if you imagine yourself as a person in the Middle Ages walking through and looking at the night sky, what what you would encounter in looking at the night sky and looking at celestial bodies is that you're looking up at a world lighted, warmed, and resonant with music. So there was this really deep sense of, of music in the uh, orbits. And this then inspires Kepler. And you know, we can kind of, in Q&A and discussion, maybe touch on that as well. But what I want to point out is that it's not a singular unitive vision. It's a vision of multiple spheres. And it's a vision that is kind of built on how do you kind of harmonize that multiplicity. Um, and create ultimately a harmony or a music. And you would think, you might think that this was lost when we moved from a geocentric universe to a heliocentric and then, and then a, uh, a relativistic universe. But actually early geology and the very language of spheres that we've been hearing about today, the lithosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the noosphere, techno, info, all of them is really the reworking of that celestial ideas of spheres. And you can really kind of track this if you go into 19th century geologists and see the coining of the word biosphere in 1875 by Edward Seuss. They're really reworking to show that you know, these spheres are actually kind of nearly concentric, just the whole earth is made up of them instead of, so, you know, for Edward Seuss, it's that the lithosphere is almost completely enveloped by the hydrosphere and then the atmosphere sits above that. And so you have a kind of a recreation of that, that multi-spherical vision for the earth. And then the biosphere is the harmonization of elements and processes and all of those. And that's what I would want to propose that the noosphere can represent today by drawing on this history is rather than a unitive kind of teleology and a, and a kind of a, an, an a, a, a priori positive unitive te teleology, the noosphere is a kind of a, a collective task and a collective almost aesthetic task, you could almost say, of looking at the diversity of planetary spheres that have differentiated, have logics of their own, some of which are kind of out of control or that we feel alienated from. So, you know, here are the technosphere, the infosphere and the biosphere. And the thought about the noosphere would actually be a framework for trying to continue to harmonize these different planetary spheres. So recognize that we're not in really a convergent moment at all, perhaps. Planetarily, we're in a potentially a divergent mode where we have different planetary spheres that are coexisting and that aren't aligning with one another and that we don't yet quite know how to align with as well. 
And so the noosphere in this sense can be a, a kind of a crucial higher level framing concept that pulls us into you know, perhaps becoming something like uh, planetary musicians. So human beings as facilitating harmonies uh, among these uh, and, and harmonizing. So no longer living in harmony with nature, but rather thinking about what possibilities for harmonizing the technosphere, infosphere, biosphere, and other spheres uh, there are in the, in the 21st century. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's where I'll, I'll conclude. And thank you so much. Sure. Thank you.